see what questions are. All right, go ahead, Christine. Okay. All right. So uh, once again, hello, my name is Christine Haug, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the Tiffany Studio, Clara Driscoll, who worked for Louis, uh, Louis C. Tiffany and the Tiffany Girls. Um, uh, Louis uh, Comfort Tiffany is hailed as a creative genius in the decorative arts. Until now, it was assumed that he designed all of the lamps, windows, mosaics, and luxury objects. In fact, many of the Tiffany lamps were designed by Tiffany's head designer, Clara Driscoll, and her Tiffany girls. In my talk today, I will highlight Driscoll's creative process as she works step-by-step -step to create masterpieces like the wisteria, dragonfly, and the poppy lamps. I will read uh, from Driscoll's firsthand accounts in the Woolcott Round Robin Letters uh, from the New York Historical Society's book, um, A New Light on Tiffany, Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany Girls. Um, so, okay, let me go to. So we're gonna start off with um, the players um, in this, um, in, in this uh, presentation. So we're gonna start off with Louis Comfort Tiffany. You'll see him on the far left here, a photograph of him with his arms crossed. Um, he was the son of Charles uh, Louis Tiffany, founder of Tiffany and Company, uh, an American artist and designer best known for his work with stained glass, especially lamps. He founded his own glass making firm in 1885 in New York City, which by 1902 became known as the Tiffany Studios. At its peak, the workshop employed more than 300 artists, many of whom were women. Clara Driscoll's recently discovered correspondence documents her employment as head of the women's glass cutting department in Tiffany Studios at the turn of the century. Um, the letters reveal that she was responsible for most of the firm's most iconic lampshades, including the Wisteria Dragonfly and Poppy, as well as many other objects made with glass, bronze, and mosaic. So when you, for example, when you read from left to right image-wise, image you have uh, Louise Comfort Tiffany here. Uh, next is the peacock lamp. Um, that was actually designed by Clara Driscoll, not Tiffany. Um, she designed both the lampshade, it's a leaded lampshade, and the base. Um, down below, you see a jack in the pulpit. It's a favorable uh, vase. And to the left of that, that was designed by Tiffany, and it's winter, a winter stained glass. Uh, from the series and from the Four Seasons. So uh, Louis C. Tiffany was the artistic visionary for Tiffany Studios, but he had a lot of collaborators and um, top on the list is a designer like Clara Driscoll. You, he had to collaborate with artists and craftsmen, women artists, women glass selectors, glass blowers, glass chemists, and metal workers. So we're gonna ask Jason to run an audio now. It comes courtesy of the New York Historical Society. It's uh, about glass sheets and shards because um, the Tiffany Studios had to create all of the glass that you see in their objects. Okay, Jason, so you're gonna just run it. Okay. The special quality of a Tiffany lamp comes largely from the glass. In front of the lamps along this wall, you can see the raw material the Tiffany girls used to make the lampshades. In this section, we are concentrating on lampshades that have a basic yellow coloration. In selecting glass for a particular lampshade, the women had sheets of glass, and each sheet of glass was actually made by hand. Now walk over to the wall at your right and look at a group of dramatic hanging shades. In them, you'll find a variety of textures and colors of glass, much of it manufactured at Tiffany's own factory in Queens. Tiffany concentrated on making glass that had particular effects in it, such as depth or modeling. Mr. Tiffany called me into his studio this morning and showed me some of the most wonderful glass I ever saw that he has just succeeded in making. I'm dreadfully scared about it and can't bear to cut into it for fear of making an irrevocable mistake. 
If I were a genius, I could do something perfectly wonderful that would take Mr. Tiffany's breath away and bring honor to me. Clara trained her Tiffany girls to select the right glass for even the smallest lampshade detail. In selecting glass for a leaf, you might want something that had some striations in it, whereas for a blossom, you would want something that was perhaps lighter or darker in the center. When you're talking about a piece of glass that might be under a half an inch square, it really makes a difference to the overall success of the shade that each piece is used to best advantage in rendering depth or the natural texture. You'll discover a few final exceptional pieces as you leave the exhibition. Okay, so um, what you would uh, understand from the audio is that Louise Comfort Tiffany's glassmaking was his greatest contribution. So the, I'm just did a very quick listing of. Oh, hold on, real quick. Yeah. Just give me. Uh, was that a video? Because I didn't see a video. No, it's, it's audio. It was an audio. Uh, it was an audio. Can you okay. Go back to your share screen, Christine. Sure. And I'll be right there you back. go. Okay. There you go. I have to go help them real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. So Louise Com Comfort Tiffany. So glassmaking is his greatest contribution. And I just wanted to do a few listings of the, it's just a, such a wide, wide variety of, of glasses, types of glass that he created. I want to just point out some of the main types of glass that he created. Um, so opalescent glass, Favro glass, glass for mosaics, cold, uh, colored, uh, transparent and iridescent glass, glass for stained glass windows, glass for leaded glam shades, um, glass shades, um, glass for mosaic lamp bases, and glass for fancy goods or object deluxe, which are luxury goods like desk sets. So what you see on the left here is a blow up of the image I showed on the uh, slide before, and it shows winter, uh, Tiffany designed winter um, stained, you know, stained glass window from the Four Seasons. So Louise uh, C. Tiffany, his, his Tiffany glass was unique. And what I wanted to really zone in on is how unique it is. So if you look below, you'll see a very small picture of uh, what's the trumpet creeper lamp table lamp, and what you're looking at to the left and to the right of the lamp are um, its close-up shots of the glass. So look at the wide variety here. You have, you have model glass, you have striated glasses, you have orange within orangey red, you have um, textures, you have stripes. It's the wide, wide variety of how they're trying to create a naturalistic effect, actually. So all this glass you're looking at that you see in his pieces were created by the glass chemists and glass blowers in Tiffany Studios. So the glass was colored internally and created in a myriad of colors and textures and hues, and glass replicated the texture of nature, leaves, botanicals, and fruits. And what I wanted to point out, if you look down below here in the creeper lamp, you'll see some in the middle portion of the base of the lamp, you'll see some iridescent pressed glass, and those are called turtlebacks. And I'm highlighting this because when this lamp was recreated, um, the lamps had just become electrified. And Tiffany was very worried that his client was going to feel that the light lighting was too harsh. And so he wanted to soften the effects of the light. So they created this iridescent um, press glass or, or uh, turtlebacks. So Clara Driscoll, which you see here, this is actually taken from a photograph, a larger photograph you'll see later. This is what Clara, uh, Driscoll looked like in 1902. To the writer, his your that's uh, Louise Comfort Tiffany, and down below are is an open page from the Robin um, the Robin um, Wolcott letters 
Uh, there's thousands of them that she wrote. And uh, she really is the genius behind Louis C. Tiffany's designs. And her letters um, document her time. Uh, she was three times, she left Tiffany three times. She came, went left and came back three times, you'll see, during the time she was working for Tiffany Studios. And her letters span 1896 to 1906. That's how many letters they have. Um, she was um, an outstanding designer, new era woman. She was a fine artist, painter, and illustrator. She was a mosaic and stained glass artist artisan. She was a sculptor and carver of models. She was a middle manager of women's glass cutting department in Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. And she is the inventor of the leaded glass shades and mosaic clad bases and many objects deluxe that made Tiffany famous. Clara Driscoll background in 1861. She was born in December 15th, 1861. Clara Pierce Wolcott in Talmadge, Ohio, eldest daughter of Fanny L. Pierce Wolcott and Eliza W. V. Sorry, Wolcott. Her father died when Clara was age 12. Um, Clara grew up in a matriarchal society. Her mother and her aunt Josephine were important influences and Clara's mother highly valued education. She had sisters. Her sisters were Kate Louise, Eloise, Emily Porter, and Josephine Minor. Clara Driscoll attended Central High School in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Clara attended New Western Reserve School for Design for Women and taught briefly. Um, in 1886 to 1888, she worked as a designer for the Cleveland Furniture Company furniture maker C.S. Ramson and Company, more style fretwork. And 1888, she moved to New York City. And you can see on the left here, you look at the very, very, very top, tippy, tippy top of this, it says Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. She moves to New York City. She studies at the former Metropolitan Museum Art School, and she's hired in June 1888 by the uh, Tiffany Glass Company in Manhattan, located at 333 uh, dash 35 4th Avenue, which is now Park Avenue South and 25th Street. In 1888, she lived in Miss Todd's boarding house, which is 32 South Oxford Street, Fort Greene, Brooklyn, New York. Um, she was hired when she started out initially for Tiffany. She was not designing. She sketched and she designed, she said it's saying designed. Well, Design cartoons, if not cartoons as you think of them, but if you look to the left there, you see very, very large drawings. And these drawings were to scale for, um, for mosaics and stained glass windows. So that's what you see to the left. And then down below, you see a photograph here of uh, what she would have been doing when she was working on mosaics. So she would have been doing cartoons. She would have been sketching and doing transfer cartoons. And to the right, you'll see it's a smallest picture, but it's the Alexander Commencement Hall in Princeton University. In 1889, uh, Clara marries Francis Driscoll on Thanksgiving Day, 1889. She has to leave Tiffany Studios. Tiffany, uh, Louise Com uh, Comfort Tiffany had a policy. You could only be single or widowed in order to work for him. That's why she um, left and came back three times. Um, in 1892, um, then the, uh, Tiffany Studios, um, it, you know, there was sort of consolidation and there was Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company. They re were renamed. And um, she came back to, she returned to the Tiffany Studios when Frances uh, Driscoll dies. She is asked to head the Tiffany Studios Women's Glass Cutting Department. And it coincided with unionized male lead glazers and glass cutters go on strike. And Tiffany also opened the Sturbridge Glass Factory in Corona, Queens. So you have this uh, event where you have a um, separation between the men and women. Um, the women were in Corona, Queens. They were near the Sturbridge Glass Factory. And you have the men who are working in Manhattan and the roles of men and women in Tiffany Studios are defined at this time. So women are primarily the designers. They are paired as selectors and designers and also as selectors and cutters of glass. And I wanted to show you one example of a stained glass, oh, I'm sorry, 
It's a scene from the infancy of Christ. It's it, this on the left-hand side was designed by Louis C. Tiffany um, around 1892. And um, she and her Tiffany girls um, had to do the cartoons. They had to select the glass. They had to cut the glass. And then the stained glass window was made. 1896, uh, Clara is engaged to Edwin Waldo and she leaves Tiffany Studios. 1897, her engagement is broken. Clara's engagement is broken. She returns to Tiffany Studios. It is her most creative period in her career. Uh, Clara leads her Tiffany girls in commissions for leaded windows and mosaics. And I wanted to show you what I was just speaking about. So on the top, you have the girls working in the studio. And below you see the men taking the glass and they're applying it to um, these wooden um, shells of lampshades. 1898, this is when Clara invents the leaded glass shade for Tiffany lamps. And she also integrates it with the base with the shade. Um, I spoke to researchers at Kent State University and um, the Queens Historical Society. Those two institutions have the Robin Wolcott letters. And um, what you're seeing on the left here is a, an image of, of her letter to uh, family members talking about this specific lamp, this leaded lampshade called the flying fish shade, um, which was matched with a mosaic clad base. So um, just to, I know it's hard to read because of the script, um, but just to tell you a few points, is I would design a shade that should be made of, of amber and greens like the tanks of the fishery buildings at the World's Fair. It would look like a globe of fish with the light shining through the base. It would be conventional other, it would, uh, the base would be conventional sea and underwater following the folds, the, uh, the fish of the lamps. So you can see, this is an example of how, what she did. She wrote extensively, she recorded, she journaled and she sketched. And if you squint your eyes, you can see that in the sketch here, this is the flying fish lampshade here. And this is what she envisioned to be the mosaic clad base. In 1898, Clara moves into Miss Mary Owen's boarding house to be near Tiffany Studios and meets Edward Booth. In 1906, she travels to Europe in the summer. In 1907, Clara travels with Tiffany and Agnes Northrup, another Tiffany designer, woman designer, on a sketching vacation to Brittany. On the left-hand side here, um, we think this is Clara Driscoll on her bicycle. She bicycled everywhere. This is Grant's tomb and she bicycled everywhere. And the right, this small photograph here, this is when she was, she traveled to, um, Brittany with Tiffany and Agnes Northrup. Um, on the far left here, this is Clara Driscoll. In the middle is Tiffany and the right is Agnes Northrup. In 1909, Clara leaves Tiffany studio and marries Edward Booth on September 1st, 1909. You can see him in the part of Hamlet here. In 1930, Edward Booth retires. Clara and Edward split their time between Ormond Beach, Florida in the fall and Point Pleasant New Jersey in the spring. 1944, Clara dies towards the end of World War II. Tiffany had died more than a decade er earlier in 1933. She is buried in Talmadge Cemetery in Talmadge, Ohio with her family. Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany gr girls, who were they? Well, if you can see on the left here, um, you can see very young girls with bows in their hair, and they may be as young as 15 years of age. Um, the Tiffany girls, a glass cutter and a selector were paired. They must be single or widowed. Tiffany girls are different nationalities, Swedish, Danish, Irish, Cuban, and American. Tiffany girls were paid well for the time. This is 
the, this is the least amount of money they were paid. They were paid at comparable rates to the men, $7.50 to $9 a week. Um, they were trained at art schools and untrained too. And Clara said that they had keener sensitivities and acute artistic sense despite lacking mechanical skills. You're looking at a photo from about 1892 and you're looking below, the photograph there is 1902. On the far left, you're seeing Clara Driscoll. On the far right, bookending her is Agnes Northrup. Okay, so now we're gonna go into samples of her iconic um, lampshades and also other iconic objects, deluxe. So as an inventor of leaded glass shades and mosaic clad bases, mosaic candlesticks, ink stands, and objects deluxe that made Tiffany famous, this is the Tiffany lamp. And we're going to cut to Jason because he's going to run a YouTube video um, from the director of the New York Historical Society about this lamp and how the manufacturing process of how the daffodil lamp was made. So I do stop share, right? Yes, okay. The creative and manufacturing process in her letters, including some steps that scholars have not understood before. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through the basic steps from design to completion of a leaded shade. So the design would typically begin with watercolor sketches. And here we see two design drawings in New York Historical's collection. You may recognize them from um, uh, the drawers on the mezzanine of the Tiffany Gallery. Uh, both are variations on daffodil lamps. After uh, an initial sketch, these designs would be worked up in three dimensions on a plaster model of the shade and the watercolor would be painted onto the plaster. At that point, the, the plaster model would be shown to Mr. Tiffany for his approval. The next step would be to create the design in two dimensions, full size in a drawing such as this known as a cartoon. And this is actually the uh, cartoon for the drop head dragonfly design that we saw earlier. The cartoon indicated each segment of glass so that a brass template could be cut for each one of these segments. Here's an example of the brass templates, just, just a small number of the brass templates used for the dragonfly shade. The glass selectors would, would uh, score around the, the brass templates to cut out each piece of glass. And they would use an infinite supply of glass produced at Tiffany's uh, furnaces in Corona, Queens. Um, and I, I have to mention the terrible irony um, that Corona Queens today, the, sor the source of, uh, of all of this gorgeous glass, um, one of the hardest hit uh, neighborhoods in the city during the pandemic. Um, but these, these two sheets uh, give you just, just a bit of a sense of the incredible um, variety and the beautiful special effects available in Tiffany's glass. Once the pieces were cut, uh, they were individually wrapped with copper foil around the edges in preparation for soldering. The copper foiling was an important innovation initially patented in 1886 that allowed the glass to be joined with delicate lines of solder as opposed to the thick lead canes that had been used on windows. And it was the men who did the manly work of soldering the shades together over wooden molds like this one. This is the um, mold for the arrowhead shade. Um, and you can see the design uh, lightly etched on the surface. Here's a photograph of the men's department showing the men assembling shades uh, from around 1910. And, um, 
notice the stacks of shades on the shelves at the back of the workshop. You can, you can tell that they were producing these lampshades in quantity. And finally, once the shades were finished and a price tag fixed, they were ready to go up for sale at Tiffany's Manhattan showroom or a number of um, high-end department stores around the country. This image is from 1913. It depicts Tiffany's showroom um, at their later headquarters on Madison Avenue and 45th Street. Notice there are not just lamps here, but many other um, what they would call fancy goods, i.e. desk accessories, tablewares, and all sorts of items suitable for gift giving. Okay, go ahead, Christine. You can. Okay. Your... Okay. So um, now we're going to look at some other examples. So this is the dragonfly table lamp. You and let it share your screen, Christine. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the dragonfly table lamp from 1899. Um, can you see the um, upside down dragonflies? Can you see this is the body? These are the wings. It's against the green. This is a leaded, um, a leaded glass shade. It's matched with a designed bronze base. Um, you can see the dragonflies are in bronze. It's actually against mosaic tiles. In the next slide, we'll look at a close-up of this. I'm highlighting this as one of her iconic shades because um, it won an award at the Paris World's Fair of 1900, but um, um, it wasn't reported that she won this award till four years later in the New York Daily News on April 17th, 1904. So what you're looking at down below is her very detailed sketch of her design for the dragonfly table lamp. Here is a close up of the base. You can see the bronze dragonflies. You can see it against the mosaic tile. And I'm going to read you a quote of Clara's about the dragonfly table lamp. April 6th, 1899, the dragonfly lamp is an idea that I had last summer and which Alice Goovey worked out on a plaster mold. After she made the drawing on this plaster mold, I took it in hand and we worked and we worked on it until the cost built up such a rate that they mark it at $250 when it was finished and everyone, even Mr. Belknap thought that it was impractical on account of the cost. But then Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Belknap, these are two of the men from the men's section, is very original and it makes talk. So perhaps it's not a bad investment. Then Mr. Tiffany got well and came down and said it was the most interesting lamp in the place. And then a rich woman bought it. And then Mr. Tiffany said she couldn't have it. He wanted it to go to London and have another one made for her and one to go to Paris. So they asked me to estimate on four more on the condition that we'd have one of them in a week. Um, here is another lamp of hers. It's called the poppy lamp. You can see the poppies here. You can see the leaves of the poppy here in the leaded uh, glass shade. It's designed with a bronze base. You can see that you have it looks like it sort of like uh, flares out there. And we're going to have Jason run an audio for the New York Historical Society that's going to talk about how the poppy lamp was made. Elaborate lamps. This poppy shade was constructed by the Tiffany girls under Clara's supervision. Nina Gray. The Tiffany girls came from a variety of backgrounds. Some of them had gone to art school and studied design. Many of them were completely untrained, which was something that actually Tiffany found appealing so that they could be molded to have an appreciation of the Tiffany materials. The Tiffany girls worked in pairs to craft each shade, one woman selecting the glass and her assistant then cutting it. The patterns are all laid out on a flat piece of glass that has had the design traced on it in black paint. 
and this piece of glass put in one of the windows against the light and the right glass selected and cut for each pattern. The cut pieces of colored glass were then sent to the factory where they were assembled on a wooden mold with inscribed guidelines. There, each piece of glass is taken off and put on its corresponding space on the mold where they are all fastened together with metal and the whole thing drawn off a complete shade. It is then put in an electric bath and plated with copper. Then it comes back here to be sold. The poppy shade here establishes a sense of depth and botanical realism by using metal filigree sections made by acid etching the metal. These filigrees are placed sometimes behind and sometimes in front of either the poppy blossom, the center of the blossom, or the leaf. Depending on whether they're in front or in back, they give a slightly different feeling for the flowers. Okay, so um, what you see in the lower right hand corner there is this is a watercolor sketch of Clara Driscoll's design. It was done by Alice Gooby. Um, she, Clara worked with Alice Gooby and Ann Northrup um, and with other illustrators to um, illustrate her designs. Um, because they all had a different style and she found uh, that it was very helpful to do that. Another um, uh, table lamp is the Wisteria table lamp. And you can see that, um, you can see the branches here of the Wisteria tree. You can see the blossoms that sort of fall down like this. You can see it's sort of a regular uh, edge here. And this uh, Wisteria lamp, table lamp is amongst others um, that I would call sculptural because of the uniqueness of how they were designed. And you can see the tree trunk, the base, uh, the bronze tree trunk um, extends from up here to down below. Um, I also wanted to point out to the right, this is another uh, wisteria table lamp, but this was, you can see the difference in the glass treatment here. This, these were put together by the men um, versus to the right were the women the glass selectors and, um, and the glass cutters. Um, this is a cobweb table lamp. Um, if you can see at the top here, you can see a cobweb pattern, right? And it's another sculptural lamp of hers. It is uh, matched with the um, a mosaic, a narcissus. These are narcissus flowers you can see here. You can see blossoms here and you can see stems and leaves. Um, um, in late 1897, this is when Clara Driscoll inaugurated new product designs uh, like this combining you know, leaded glass shapes with a mosaic um, lamp bases. We're back to the leaded glass flying fish. Um, I wanted to give you more of a close up of what we looked at before. This is the uh, leaded glass uh, flying fish shade on the left with Clara Driscoll's letter below. And I wanted to show you more of a close up of the mosaic clad base that it was matched with. Can you see sort of the shells here? Can you see there's a uh, seahorse, you have an underground, uh, undersea theme, and you have uh, seaweed and rocks and coral. And uh, this deep sea base um, was designed by Clara Driscoll with Agnes Northrup and Alice Gooby. In 1897 to 1899, Clara Driscoll inaugurated new types of objects such as small boxes, like here, um, you have ink stands, which are like, for example, here. Um, you have clocks. Um, you have, this is a glass screen. And you have this, this is carp in water in a mosaic plaque. And then here is a bowl. This is favoral glass that you can see here. Uh, the butterfly lamp. And from 1898 was um, a special lamp for her. And um, 
it was, um, you can see yellow butterflies against a blue sky. You can see down below, you can see a primrose mosaic base. And it's another sculptural design of hers. And she, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in June 29th, 1898, Clara Driscoll talks about designing this lamp. So last and most important is a big, beautiful lamp made of the evening primrose, like that field of them on Mr. Root's land in Talmadge, Ohio. This in mosaic will be a lamp and a cloud of little yellow butterflies, which you know ex look exactly like the primrose blossom and a network of gold wire made in beautiful lines like the lines of smoke is to be the shade. I described this to Mr. Tiffany while he is in Mr. Mitchell's office sitting in front of an electric fan. And I didn't include all of the quote, but what Mr. Tiffany did is he was so excited by her design and her sketch that he took out a pencil and he started scribbling all over it. And then he walked away and he said, oh, you will figure it out or words to that effect. Um, Clara Driscoll was also inspired by uh, Louis C. Tiffany, designer Agnes Northrup, Alice, Alice Gooby, and this is a sketch actually by Clara Driscoll, a presentation scap, and Lillian Palmy. She was a wonderful artist um, also there at the time. Clara Driscoll was inspired by New York City at the turn of the century. What you're seeing on the left here is the, um, the Metropolitan um, Museum Art School at the turn of the century. Clara bicycled everywhere. She rode the new subway. She was an active theater goer and went to the concert hall. She explored New York City and followed local New York City and national elections. She sailed on the SS America to Europe. She sketched, journaled, and wrote constantly. And she improvised and experimented with different materials, stained glass, leaded glass, bronze, leaded windows, and mosaics. She was inspired by European travels. So you see on the left here, this is Clara playing shuffleboard on the SS America that she sailed to Europe on. She traveled to Europe in 1906 and again in 1907 with Tiffany and Agnes Northrup on a sketching vacation to Brittany. And I wanted to go back to this photograph because I learned that they are, um, in this photograph I said left is, this is Clara Driscoll in the middle is Mr. Tiffany and to the right is Agnes Northrup. And this is them sketching in Paris on the Rue de Salle. So in closing, um, I hope that you have shown today, shown you today the many contributions that Clara Driscoll and our Tiffany girls have made to the Tiffany Studios legacy. In addition, we learned how Clara Driscoll was identified as the inventor of the leaded glass shades and mosaic clad bases for lamps and many of the luxury objects that Tiffany became renowned for worldwide. It is a discovery of the Clara Driscoll's correspondence that inspired the New York Historical Society's landmark book, A New Light on Tiffany, Clara Driscoll and the Tiffany Girls, that we touched on just a bit today. It prompts us to re-examine the important Tiffany collection in the New York Historical Society and to acknowledge Clara Driscoll's and our Tiffany Girls' many contributions to the Tiffany Studios lamps, windows, mosaics, and luxury objects that made Tiffany famous. So what we're going to end with today is I really encourage you to go to the New York Historical Society because their, they, their entire collection of 132 Tiffany lamps and three windows, which came from a single gift of a single collector, Dr. Egon Neustadt in 1884, it's there in the New York Historical Society. Dr. Uh, Neustadt was an Austrian immigrant, New York City orthodontist, and successful real estate developer. He began collecting Tiffany lamps in 1935 when he and his wife Hildegard purchased their first lamp in a Greenwich Village antique shop. And we're gonna have Jason just go to the New York Historical uh, Society website and show you some more pictures of the gallery. What you see on the lower left there is 
you can be a virtual selector and put together your own lamp. It's a fun virtual um, experience, immersion experience. <laughs> That's what you call. So, Jason, if you could, do you want me to do stop share? Yeah. I, I, I. Okay. So we uh, we can't really zoom in, but you. I hope you can see this. But it kind of goes through. They're beautifully displayed. They redesigned the whole fourth floor to have these to have the new stat collection. It's spectacular. Mm -hmm. And I want to try my hand at being a selector. <laughs> I want to go to the virtual immersion, <laughs> the virtual immersion and create my own lampshade. So uh, did anybody have, quite, all right, first of all, great job, Christine. Thanks, great. thanks. Fantastic. Um, did anybody have any questions about her presentation? Karen, go ahead. Not that I have any questions, but um, I often visited the Lillian Nassau um, store and she, it, it was, um, I went to the high school of art and design and it was right near there. And so I've seen many of the Tiffany, you know, lamps and I've liked them forever. I've always liked them and they're, I don't think there's anything that can compare to them art wise. Mm -hmm and really should be experienced in person because they are just so, I mean, you're just seeing them on the screen, but when you see them in person, it's just unbelievable. unbelievable. You will never forget it. You will never forget it. They're Marcia, beautiful. What, yeah, Marsha, what do you think? Yes, it's quite a collection. Um, I wonder uh, what is the, um, uh, are, are these lamps being sold today or uh, what is the uh, sale of, of these? Are people buying them? Are they still popular? If you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have to, from, from, from reading her quotes, reading her letters, I mean, they were really made for the wealthy back then. When you're talking about designing a lamp, like 1898, 1899 for $250 or more. I mean, they were made for the wealthy. Um, as far as the going rate, I'd have to go look that up. I'd have to go to the auction houses and see what the current going price is um, for um, a Tiffany lamp. But I can only imagine that probably in today's market is probably almost a half of a million dollars, I would think for like the dragonfly lamp, particularly dragonfly lamp. Remember, it won an award at the Paris Exposition of 1900. And if you think of the materials that went into it, I mean, you have leaded glass, all of the glass is all custom made, right? You're, 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 you're marrying it to a, a mosaic clad base. So then you have mosaic work, then you have you know, gilded bronze dragonflies, right? I can only imagine just the sheer, you know, craftsmanship and the, the you know, the uh, materials that went into the lamps is just incredible. Honestly, wow. from, from the, uh, the pictures you had, it looked like they were producing a pretty good amount. So, I, so, that, yeah. so in 1998, uh, one of the Tiffany lamps sold at Sotheby's for 2.8 million in 1998. 1998. Yes, that's the most valuable one that, that ever was. I just looked it up on the internet. So. Holly, do you have any question? Um, <laughs> well, I'll, I, I was, when I was kind of marketing your program with the one of our art classes, I was telling them about a book I read, not this summer, but last summer called um, Behind Every Woman. And, and it's by Nancy Russell, who was the wife of a a uh, Western artist named Charles Russell, who's a contemporary of Frederick Remington. They, they were um, kind of, a, they were colleagues of each other. Mm -hmm. But the book was about the fact, the title is Behind Every, Every Man, you know, Behind Every Man is a Good Woman. And these artists, it's kind of interesting that the women didn't get credit, but in fact, you know, the women with a lot of these artists wouldn't be artists without their wives doing the marketing. And in this case, you know, these women really were doing the work. And uh, we all think it's a Lewis Comfort Tiffany that he made them all. And 
In fact, he had these very talented women. And I'm pleased to know that they were paid well. They were paid well. Yeah. You're paid well. And they were recognized and, uh, for their talent and uh, their skill. And, and Tiffany paid for her to go to Europe to sketch and study in 1906. And then he took her with Agnes Northrup in 1907 to Europe. Just to um, sketch and to observe and to be inspired and and think of it, she left Tiffany and came back three times, <laughs> right? Yeah. So he knew her value. I mean, he he recognized her talents and he knew her value, and she had many many skills. And Does that mean she had three husbands? No, because the first, the second uh, was, didn't, wasn't a husband. She was engaged to him and then he disappeared. That's a long story. And then her engagement was broken and then she returned the to study. <laughs> well, I found it interesting that they wanted single women and. Single and, or widowed, single or widowed, right. Right. And coincidentally, when, when she did get married, she left Tiffany. Yes. And also when she got engaged, she left Tiffany. Yes. And then was supposed to get married. Yes. Was hired back. Um, yes. When she was newly single. <laughs> yes. Right. Newly single. I think, you know, it was the time, you know, it just, she, he just felt that I guess if she was a, you know, uh, she got married and she had a child, for example, that she wouldn't give the same kind of commitment, maybe, to her work. The and maybe the children. traveling as well. Uh, I don't traveling, know. right. There was traveling. There was traveling. There was long hours, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they worked really hard. Sure. So, um, you but what fascinating about? work, right? Yes, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful uh, work. And Tiffany was what I was saying earlier about what Clara Driscoll said about her girls, about the keen sensitivity, their aesthetic sense, um, is that he, Tiffany was in agreement, total agreement with Clara Driscoll. He felt the women were the ones who had the design sense, the color sense, the aesthetic sense. And also um, they also had the ability to take a design and take templates and cut the glass to be just right. Um, and the men were more for assemblage, they were for production, right? Yeah. Do you know who um, designed the wisteria? She designed the wisteria. Okay. That's why, yeah, the, the wisteria, the dragonfly, Claire Driscoll was designing for decades. <laughs> it seems, yeah. It's interesting that there was a four year lapse between her winning, uh, her winning, um, you know, for the dragonfly lamp and it being announced in the paper, the Karen, Daily News, four, four that, years but... later. <laughs> Karen knows all about that. Me? Yes, with your pictures. Well, I actually have some copies. Uh, no, I'm talking about your award with your name on it up here. Oh, right. I'm entering again. Okay. <laughs> You're entering again. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about your upcoming lecture, Christine? Before of you? course. So next, let me see if I have the exact name of this. Okay, so next um, Monday at the same time, same channel, um, between three and four, we're going to have... Um, a lecture on Edgar Brandt. I don't know if you're aware of him. He is a master uh, uh, for, if you say it, for Renier. Um, he designed Art Deco ironwork mm. and he's amazing. Mm. So you should come, <laughs> you should come. It's going to be a wonderful lecture. So you have any other questions about today? Uh, yes, uh, I guess what I wanted to ask before is that are there any new lamps being made or everything we see is what was made earlier? Everything that I showed today was made earlier. That's why I have dates after each of the lamps, like 1898, 1899, yeah. 1902, 1906. Everything that I showed today was made earlier. 
But are there any lamps made today? Are they in They're vision? copies. They're copies. Copies. Yeah. They're just copies. Everything is a copy. Not original, not original Tiffany lamps. It's interesting um, to note that Louise Comfort Tiffany actually started as a landscape painter. Um, and his uh, father um, owns, of course, Tiffany and Company. And so he went this route as far as being in the decorative arts, you know, so with glass and glass making. Um, and I have got to think that because he started out as a, you know, as a landscape painter that he was, you know, he thought it was terrific that like Clara Driscoll was such a wonderful illustrator painter and uh, how she was trained. Yeah. Uh, most of the copies are made in China. So oh. <laughs> you can imagine, no way. Oh. You can imagine they come nowhere near. Tiffany lamps. I mean, there's... you should go to the you should go to New York Historical Society. I, you should I've see the many. lamps in person. I, yeah. I have seen many. Like I said, Lillian Nassau's shop. I did a tour there with some women, and okay. she explained it. I don't even know if it's there anymore. But I've been to many um, lectures on on Tiffany and seen the lamps. Yeah, in various museums in the city. Uh huh. Well, this was a very good turnout. Thank you, everybody, for coming. If you want to do the next one, please give us a call uh, or go online and register, uh, and we'll send out a Zoom link probably. I'll send it out day of, okay? Just so it's fresh on your email. Okay. 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 Thank you so much, Christine. Great job. Thank okay. You. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Enjoy Great. the rest of your- Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. It was so interesting. Thank that you. everybody could come. Bye. I did record it. I See will you send next it out week. in case you missed it, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye.